Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Three Down Nation podcast. I'm Justin Dunk, joined by John Hodge and J.C. Abbott. J.C., I'm just checking in. Did you piss off any coaches this past week? I'm sure I pissed off all of them, Dunk. That is <laughs> all that's my of mission. Them. <laughs> that's my mission every week. Just get as many arrows pointed my way as possible. Hodge, what about you? Did Mike O'Shea give you the cut eye when you asked him who may or may not have squirted water on an official in Winnipeg? I no, but that's because he just lied and said he didn't know anything about it. So he was very nice, but I'm almost 100 percent sure he lied. <laughs> so next time he'll give you the cut eye because you just called him a liar. Uh, I didn't say he was a liar. I say I suspect that he lied to me. That's a that's different. Those are two different things. Fair. Let's get into it, fellas. We're discussing the Toronto Argonauts clinching the final playoff spot in the CFL. The BC Lions embarrassing themselves in Regina. The Calgary Stampeders signing longtime NFL quarterback P.J. Walker. McLeod Bethel Thompson getting fined for a third time this CFL season. And Jake Thomas's late hit on Chad Kelly. But first. First place in the West Division is still up for grabs as Winnipeg lost at home to Toronto and Saskatchewan dusted the Lions in Regina. Both teams are on bye weeks before returning to the field on October 26th when the Blue Bombers visit Montreal and the Riders host Calgary. Winnipeg can still clinch first place with a win. However, if the Bombers lose to the Alouettes, Saskatchewan has a chance to finish first with a win over the Stamps. Dunk, who will finish first? Winnipeg or Saskatchewan? I have a hard time envisioning the Bombers, yes, I know they have to go to Montreal, losing this football game. I thought, though, that Winnipeg would wrap this up, beat the Toronto Argonauts at home, and go into what they're used to doing the last number of years, and that's deciding who to rest and who to give a little bit of playing time to to keep them fresh to go into that West Final. This is a different situation, though, because to do this, they have to go on the road to Montreal who just beat the Ottawa Red Blacks in a game that was meaningless to the Owls with Davis Alexander, who is now, by my count, fellas, correct me if I'm wrong, undefeated as a starter. I think he's 4-0. Is that right? 4-0. Yes. Plus one Perfect come from behind victory off the bench. 4-0. Yes, you're right. And a come from behind victory at home against the Riders off the bench in that second half that was unbelievable. So kind of in a way, he's 5-0, and if you will. All that said, this is not going to be easy for Winnipeg to go and get it done. The Riders are in a fortunate position that the Bombers play earlier on that Saturday, so they'll know exactly what's in front of them before they kick off against the Calgary Stampeders. You know, I'm going to sit on the fence here because I think there's a chance it can go either way. If this game was at home, I would lean to the Bombers getting it done. But Montreal has shown that whoever's in the lineup there plays fast and physical. And that this team can win ball games without Cody Fajardo and some of the other starters being in the lineup. So the Bombers got to prove it to me because I think this team is a little bit different from the ones in the past. There is that motivation that they know the Riders are playing the Stamps and that's likely going to be a win. But I do think there is a better chance here than a lot of people thought, at least even as recently as four weeks ago before the Riders went on this winning streak, that Saskatchewan could actually finish first. I just want to touch on the Alexander because, yes, the, you know, the record that he has is impressive. That being said, his wins have come over as a starter. Hamilton, Hamilton, Saskatchewan, and Ottawa. And the Saskatchewan game was the game where Brett Lother missed 17 field goals. So the Alex should not have won And he stepped out of that. bounds, probably. And, and he probably stepped out of bounds. So, like... <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not trying to take anything away from Davis Alexander. I actually thought he played pretty poorly against Ottawa, even with the weather conditions, but whatever. He did enough to win the game. You got him credit for that. So the record's nice. When you look at the the you know, the ins and outs of the games, it's maybe not as impressive as the record makes it out to be. Um, I think Winnipeg is gonna get it done. And to me, this is not a two game thing because look, we all know that Saskatchewan's gonna be Calgary in week twenty one at Mosaic Stadium. There's no way Calgary's winning that game. So this is a one-off for Winnipeg. Can you go into Montreal 
and beat the Alouettes in week 21 when the Alouettes are going to have nothing to play for and will presumably be resting a number of players. And it's true that with Cody Fajardo sitting out this past week and obviously the Alouettes getting a first round bye in the playoffs, I would assume that Montreal wants to put him on the field some point between now and then. Uh, To me, I think the obvious choice is you put him on the field this week against BC. Uh, The Lions currently have nothing to play for. They don't for their last two games this season, or pardon me, last game, because they have a week 21 bye. Um, You put him on the field in Vancouver, you know, you tell him, hey, enjoy the West Coast road trip, and then you set him for week 21. So I don't think that the Bombers should walk into that Montreal game expecting to dominate, because I thought Winnipeg's performance at home was very disappointing. I mean, defensively, I think you got to give him credit. The goal line stands were sensational. They were flat-footed on on that first drive there that Dave Unger capped with a touchdown for the Argos. After that, the defense was great. Special teams-wise, the two misses from Sergio Castillo were brutal, uh, but they did get the fumble recovery from Brian Cole, I thought, which was brilliant, forcing a fumble from Janarian Grant. By the way, shout out to uh, Josh Fry of the Winnipeg Free Press. We were chatting before the game, and he said, what do you think Janarian's going to do? And I said, well, you know, Janarian Grant's ball security was always an issue here. It wouldn't surprise me if he puts one on the turf today, but he'll probably also get a nice return. And then lo and behold, five minutes into the game, Janarian puts one on the ground, and I looked at Josh in the press box, and I just went, bada bing, bada boom, there it is. And then he had, to Janarian's credit, a great return later on. So, uh, the offense, though, was terrible. Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Zach Kolaris did not look remotely in sync with his receivers. He held onto the ball for too long on a number of those sacks. The offensive line also struggled at the point of attack on some of those sacks, giving up seven. And the only way you got seven sacks allowed in a game is if you have breakdowns in all aspects. It's game planning. It's play calling. It's blocking up front. It's miscommunication between the quarterback and his receivers and a lack of decision-making. And I'll give Zach Kolaris full credit after the game, readily admitting this was not my best performance. I was holding onto the ball too long. He, he, he felt bad for the offensive line, knowing that they take all this pride and not allowing a lot of sacks. Seven is a terrible number on the stat sheet. Um, but I have to think that the Bombers are going to bounce back. They know how much hosting the West Final will give them an advantage. Winning that game in Regina is going to be a lot tougher than winning that game in Winnipeg. So I'm picking the Bombers. But um, you would have loved to have seen a better performance this past week. There's no doubt. I think both of these teams are going to win their respective season finales. So by default, Winnipeg's going to get first place and the West final will go back to Princess Auto Stadium. Although I do think that the Bombers matchup with Montreal is a much less certain one than Saskatchewan's matchup with Calgary. And I think... You talked about that performance there, Hodge, that they had against Toronto, and what it provided was a blueprint for how you beat this version of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Because unlike in the past, Zach Caleros is not the engine that makes this team go, right? He has struggled mightily this season, and with the exception of that one six-touchdown game a few weeks ago, he has just not looked like the same player in any way, shape, or form. He doesn't have the same offensive line in front of him, which doesn't help either. And if you can get pressure on him, he's not going to be a guy this year who's going to beat you single-handedly. So if you contain Brady Oliveira and you play good defense, this will not be a high-scoring team. The trick, unfortunately, is trying to get one over top of that tremendous Bombers defense. And that's where I think Montreal will struggle with presumably Davis Alexander at quarterback in this final week. You pointed out the teams he's beaten. None of those teams have a defense or a secondary like Winnipeg's, which I think is the best in the league. Right now, that's keeping them in the fight because their offense isn't versatile enough or isn't explosive enough with the way Zach Caleros is playing. And I'm sure every single team in the league that might come up against Winnipeg in the playoffs is circling that Toronto game and going, how can we replicate this formula, but put a few more points on the board? The Toronto Argonauts clinched the sixth and final playoff spot in the CFL with the team's win over Winnipeg, eliminating 
The rival down the QEW, Hamilton Tiger Cats. The Argos are second in the East Division following Ottawa's Thanksgiving loss to the Alouettes. The Double Blue can clinch a home playoff game when the Argos host the Red Blacks at BMO Field. Hodge, do you think Toronto can get it done? I absolutely think the Argonauts are going to get it done. And frankly, I think the Argonauts are the best team in the East Division right now. And I'll harken back to something that I've said on the show many times, so I'm not going to rehash it entirely. But the first half of the CFL season matters, right? If the playoffs were only based on Labor Day onward, then I think Edmonton would be in the playoffs in the West Division. And I think Hamilton would be in playoffs in the East Division. And the team looking out, right, of the West Division, who we'll talk about a little later in the show, would be BC. And the team out of the East Division playoff picture would be Ottawa. The Red Blacks have simply not been a good football team as of late. I thought the penalties that they took were frankly shameful on Thanksgiving. And by the way, my feeling after watching that Thanksgiving football game was I'm thankful that most CFL games are not like this because this was the average CFL game. I don't think the ratings would be nearly as good as they are because that game was ugly and a slugfest. And I appreciate that the weather played a role in that, but it was it was about as ugly a CFL game as you'll find. Um, to me, the Toronto Argonauts are doing an incredible job of getting to the fo- uh, getting to the football defensively, forcing those takeaways. That front seven has finally started to play at the level I thought they would play at all year, led by Flo Orimilade, Jake Ceresna, Winton McManus. And then offensively, there's not much sexy about what they're doing. Like Kadeem Carey's running the ball well. He got nicked up in that Winnipeg game. We'll have to see whether or not he practices, whether or not he plays this week. But Chad Kelly is being smart with the football. One touchdown, no interceptions is not a bad stat line. When you play in Winnipeg this year, JC touched on how good that Blue Bombers defense has been. And obviously the crowd in Winnipeg makes it a very difficult place to play. The Argonauts managed the noise brilliantly. Chad Kelly did not put the ball in harm's way. And uh, special teams wise, I mean, yeah, Janarian Grant's going to put one on the turf every now and again. But he's generally been sensational this year. Liam Hyralahu, as consistent as any kicker in the CFL. Um, I I love what the Argos are doing. I think they are not only going to clinch second place in the East Division this week. I think they are going to do so possibly by a large margin at home against these Red Blacks. I would agree with that assessment, Hodge. And what I want to highlight here is I've said my piece about Chad Kelly in the past. There's not a whole lot that I respect about him as a man right now. But as a football player, the things that he's done since coming back, I think have been very impressive and and not nearly uh, reflected in the stats that he's put up. I think he still has more interceptions than touchdowns. They are not numbers that will blow you away. But in each of these victories by Toronto, he's taken exactly what the defense has given him. He hasn't been overly brash. He hasn't been um, risky with the football. He's playing a more conservative game where the ability to hit those big plays, those explosive plays is still there and he utilizes it, but he's not pressing. And that was, I think, what a lot of people thought would be his undoing coming back from the situation he faced this offseason was that he was going to be all fired up to prove the Hagers wrong, wanting to stick it to a bunch of people, and would make rash decisions and collapse as a result. He hasn't done that. And in fact, in the most adverse situations, like going in to Winnipeg or playing against a BC team that was pretty outspoken in their criticism of him and certainly motivated him, he has been more poised than even what we saw from him last year. And I think Chad Kelly's play is going to be a big reason why the Argos are successful in the playoffs. And frankly, I would take them to beat the Montreal Alouettes right now. I don't know if I'm going to go that far in terms of the Argos beating the Alouettes in a possible East final, but there is no doubting right now that the Toronto Argonauts are on the upswing and the Ottawa Red Blacks are on the downswing. And I look no further, fellas, than Bob Dice getting defensive and terse with the media yet again when he was asked about his team potentially backing in 
to the playoffs. Well, when you haven't won in a while, and yes, you played well enough in the first half of the season, as Hodge illustrated, it is about your entire season to clinch a playoff berth. I think you should be rewarded for that. But the Red Blacks would be arguably right there with the BC Lions, perhaps behind them, if we're talking about rankings and odds, however you want to put it, in terms of winning the Grey Cup based on the teams that are going to be in the postseason. So that's why I think that the Toronto Argonauts are going to win this football game unless there is a minor upset, I'll say. If Drew Brown can get back healthy for this game, then I think that gives the Red Blacks a legitimate shot to win it and lock up second place. If he's not playing, I have a hard time seeing it. And I'll just quickly say this. As a proud Winnipegger to another proud Winnipegger in Bob Dice, who is an extremely nice man, for the record, and who I like a lot, uh, your team stinks right now. Uh, I'm just going to say that. You're one in five in your last six games. Four of those five losses have come by double-digit points. And the undisciplined penalties, like the unnecessary roughness calls and the objectionable conduct penalties, the -the after-the-play stuff on Thanksgiving, was embarrassing. So I'm not saying this team is bad. I'm not saying that they can't win the Grey Cup. I'm not saying that they shouldn't be in the playoffs. But the fact that they are backing into the playoffs is undeniable. And I think only a fool, and Bob Dice is, again, a very smart man. He's not a fool. So I know that he's saying this from an emotional standpoint, not a logical standpoint. Only a fool would say they're not backing into the playoffs. This team has to get it on track. They have to get it on track now because there is a lot to like about this team. There's a reason they still have a winning record, despite the fact that they're one in five in their last six games. By the way, that includes a 16 point loss to Hamilton, a team that's not going to the playoffs. Like this has been a really rough stretch for this team. And yeah, the injuries are part of it. But every team's banged up at this point of the year. The Red Blacks need to stop the excuses, and they need to get this right. Even something as simple as, hey, it's Thanksgiving. We're going into Montreal. Can we not shoot ourselves in the foot half a dozen times with stupid penalties? They couldn't do that. Like, Money Hunter took two penalties on the same play, both for silly reasons. Like, this wasn't a ticky-tacky PI call. This was, oh, I'm going to grab somebody's face mask and then throw them out of bounds, and then push somebody. That's not playoff football. That's not smart football. That's not good football. So, um, I again, I think that this team could make some noise, but maybe, maybe they just need a reality check a little bit in Ottawa. The BC Lions will officially finish third in the West Division following their one-sided loss in Regina, meaning they'll have to win road games against Saskatchewan and Winnipeg in some order if they hope to play at home in this year's Grey Cup. What are the chances they'll be able to pull that off, JC? I think the chances are extremely limited. That was... An embarrassing display from the BC Lions this week. I know some around the league felt that I was a little bit harsh in my criticism of the team uh, in my post-game article. I'll say this. You know who didn't think it was harsh? Any fan who watched that football game. And they are not happy right now here on the West Coast, despite the gorgeous weather and all the ocean views. They are not happy because their football team continually plays uninspired, boring, dreadful football every time they get a chance to step on the field, even when they're winning games. Like this, two weeks ago against Calgary, they got the victory, but that offense was atrocious, and it was the same thing. They got some good defensive plays, some fortunate bounces that were able to turn the tide there, but that wasn't an indication of a football team that was any better. And they went into Saskatchewan and they got their butts kicked. And not only that, once the butt kicking started, they rolled over onto their backs, exposed their bellies and let it happen. I do not have any faith in this BC Lions team right now. And there is only one possible way that it can get turned around. And that appears to be the direction that this team is going in, that's going to be a change at quarterback. Vernon Adams Jr. is taking the first team reps in practice as we speak 
right now, he's going to likely start in the season finale against Montreal this week, and they'll see if he can provide any sort of spark for what has been a wayward football team for the last several months. You know, I thought going into that game after speaking to Nathan Rourke for, you know, around half an hour, potentially even longer, and I do appreciate his time, that there was a sense that it could be, I don't want to call it a breakout game for Nathan Rourke, but a reemergence. He played really well in that touchdown Pacific game. And outside that, and maybe that one game in Montreal that BC was able to win, you know, he hasn't been good enough. And I think he would admit that. But I felt like after our conversation, which you can see in its entirety or listen to in its entirety through Sports Cage, that he got a lot of stuff potentially off of his chest about the NFL and was direct about his future in the CFL. It kind of led me to believe that we would see this difference from him. But after thinking about the conversation, Things come to mind for me, such as fans, and I think even in the media, we make this mistake sometimes too, expect players to be robots and be able to go out and perform regardless of the situation. Now, they're paid as professionals to go and do so, so you need to do that, and Nathan Work would agree with that. But this guy is in his fifth offense this year alone. And think of the whirlwind he's been on, not just from a timeline standpoint, but also emotions and the fact that he didn't have training camp with this football team to be its real and true leader, I think has had an effect. And it's difficult when you come into a locker room past midseason and try to not necessarily even take over because it does seem like based on people I've talked to and from my own perspective, that Vernon Adams Jr. and Nathan Work do have a pretty good working relationship. It just seems like there's a difference there because Vernon Adams Jr. was literally flying his teammates out to have off-season workouts because he was approaching the season as being the number one guy. And I think a lot of people were surprised that Nathan Work's even back in the CFL in 2024. So there's a lot going on here. But I think either way, no matter who's at quarterback, that guy has to play better. Like, we have not seen the Nathan Rourke from 2022, but for a couple glimpses this season. Vernon Adams Jr. started the season super hot, and that's what a lot of people remember, but he was not playing good football. That was part of the reason why the Lions were willing to bring Nathan Rourke back for a pretty sizable chunk of change in 2024 and a massive amount of money in 2025 and 2026. Well, Nathan Rourke played at what can only be described as a Doug Flutie level back in 2022. Mm -hmm. And when he went out and looked great with the Jacksonville Jaguars in the preseason in 2023, I think as members of the media, we went, holy smokes, like this kid's coming back to the CFL. Well, this is who's going to be there. And the BC Lions, I certainly thought this and obviously I was wrong. I thought the BC Lions were going to run away with the West Division. That's not only not happened, but this team has hit the reverse button. This team is 3-8 and eight in its last 11 games. They are now below 500. I did not have that in the cards for BC whatsoever. And I think, honestly, on the one hand, as much as, yes, we in the media maybe expected too much of Nathan Rourke, I think the BC Lions have badly mishandled this, right? Mm-hmm. Nathan Rourke kind of had to come in right away. I get that. Jake Dolagala was not the answer there. People remember the timeline was on August 1st, Vernon Adams Jr. suffered an injury in Winnipeg. Jake Dolagala started the next game, looked not good at all in a relatively one-sided loss to Edmonton. And then Nathan Rourke signed and started immediately for the club's next game after that. I don't think BC erred in having Rourke play that first game, even though he did lose at home 20-11 to to the Blue Bombers. But he has since made seven straight starts. He's only three and five as a starter. He's thrown four touchdowns, seven picks in those games, like four touchdowns and eight starts. That is bad. I don't think you can say it any other way. That is not anywhere close to even the average output you'd expect in the CFL. And it's certainly not even in the same stratosphere as what Nathan Rourke showed he was capable of at his best in 2022. And I've said this on the show before. I think Nathan Rourke is the future. 
But I still think, as I have for weeks now, that Vernon Adams Jr. should be the right now. VA went 5-3 and three as a starter before suffering his knee injury, 14 touchdowns, only six interceptions. And Rick Campbell, I thought, did a great job when Nathan Rourke was signed, coming out immediately and releasing a statement. He said, and this is a quote, that Vernon Adams Jr. would not be traded because, quote, he's too good a player, too valuable a leader, and a huge part of our team, close quote. Well, since that statement was released, VA has attempted seven passes. Seven passes. So which is it? Is he a huge part of your team and too good a player to get rid of? Or is he just a guy who needs to, you know, clean up games every now and again while Nathan Rourke is the guy? Like, again, I think Nathan Rourke should be the guy in 2025, 2026 when he's making that huge money on that new deal that he signed. But this team had an opportunity to save its season a number of weeks ago when Vernon Adams Jr. was healthy, Nathan Rourke was struggling, and they have not pulled that pin. And if the relationship between the two is really good, I think the team has maybe thought, well, let's, you know, let's make it clear, like, the relationship here is good, there's no controversy, you know, great. Well, it's great that there's no bad feelings in your building, but right now there's bad football in your mm-hmm. building. Like, the the product, it doesn't matter how good everybody is feeling holding their hands around the campfire if the proof is not in the pudding. And right now, offensively, this team is anemic, right? So I'm glad that this team is going back to Vernon Adams Jr. And that's not to say I think Nathan Rourke's not going to be sensational in this league. I think Nathan Rourke is a future MOP. I think he's going to win a Grey Cup in Vancouver. I think he's a sensational player. But as Dunk said, these players are not robots. VA has consistently been better. Then Nathan Rourke this season, when given an opportunity, he should be the guy. And unfortunately, they've waited to pull the parachute now until the last possible second when there's no chance of going to the playoffs as a home team. Good luck winning in Winnipeg and Regina in some order. Like the BC Lions are a finesse team. Yes, they run the ball a little better better with William Stanback, but this is a team that is a supposed Olympic gold medal figure skating act. And when you go onto the prairies for playoff football, you are playing blue collar hockey. And unless you make every single perfect movement as part of this offense, absolutely perfect, you're going to get punched in the mouth. And that's what happened in Regina. By the way, here's a stat. BC's last visit to Regina combined with its last visit to Winnipeg, both losses, they were outscored 68 to 8. I'm not a mathematician, but... That's really bad. Um, if you can't win in Regina in October, you can't win, win in Winnipeg in August. I don't know how you hope to win either place in November. So I suspect this team has waited too long. It's disappointing. I thought this team was going to the Grey Cup. I don't think that anymore. Look, if, if the PC Lions offense is a figure skating act, Hodge, right now they're Nancy Kerrigan post-baseball bat. Like, they're just not the same Ouch. football team. Like, no. they are Eesh. not at all the same football team. And, to Vernon Adams Jr.'s credit, he comes out on Twitter this week and says that the Lions don't have a quarterback problem and tries to smooth over some of the controversy in the room. And I believe that these two guys like each other, that they work well together. I don't think Nathan Rourke's teammates hate him or anything of that nature. And I think the flaws in this football team go much deeper than who is under center. Let's not forget, as you pointed out, Hodge, that prior to Vernon Adams Jr.'s injury, the two prior games were them getting their butts kicked by Calgary, of all teams, and getting blanked by Winnipeg, right? Shut out entirely. That's when the wheels fell off the offense, not when Nathan Rourke came in the fold. It predates him as a member of this football team. But what is abundantly clear is this team doesn't know where to look. They don't know who their real leader is because, and we've all seen the video of them pregame getting hyped up like every football team does. And there's Vernon Adams Jr. In the middle of it, getting all his teammates jacked up, leading the chance like a starting quarterback does, like a franchise quarterback does. And Nathan Rourke giving him the space to do that, standing off to the side because he hasn't wanted to step on any of those toes. But then VA gets them all hyped up, and he's like, okay, now go out there and win with that other guy. Like, what does that do to the psyche of a football team? I have never seen a situation 
quite so strange where the guy that people see as their leaguer just isn't on the field. And frankly, it makes you question the other leaguer in that building in head coach Rick Campbell. And I've had tremendous respect for what Rick has done during his time with the BC Lions. I think his resume over the last number of seasons dictates that he should be given every opportunity, every benefit of the doubt to fix this. But the reality of the situation is he's on an expiring contract. Amar Doman is not the person who originally hired him. And he's just spent the last several months getting a private owner to shell out way more money than he reasonably should be expected to. He's going to have to pay cap fines. He's shelling out of pocket for players like Rourke and Betts with the promise of a home Grey Cup victory. Now he's not even going to get a home playoff game. And if they flounder over this last game and in the first round of the playoffs, if VA can't give them that spark, that's going to be a tough decision for Amar Doman to extend a new contract to a guy who hasn't gotten it done over the last little bit. There's some real significant questions that are going to be asked out here in Vancouver. It's such a rare situation with the quarterbacks because because you have a guy in Vernon Adams Jr. who was with the team in training camp, cemented himself as the leader, and then Nathan Rourke comes in with the added view from others in the locker room that, oh, the team went out and paid this guy a whole bunch of money who wasn't even here with us through training camp and the first part of the season to come in and take over. And I don't even think it's a case of not liking one or the other. To me, it becomes a case of, well, you have a stronger relationship with Vernon Adams Jr. just for the simple fact that he's been with this team, the 2024 version of the BC Lions, longer. That's what I think it comes down to. And especially that thought jumped to my mind when I saw the video you referenced that the BC Lions posted on their own X account of Vernon Adams Jr. getting the team hyped at Mosaic Stadium with Nathan Rourke in the background. Credit to Rourke and Vernon Adams Jr. for trying to manage what has to be an awkward situation because it seems like they've done it relatively well based on what we've seen publicly and also from some of the things we've heard behind the scenes. But this is rare. This is you know almost unprecedented, especially for these two guys to have to deal with. And there's so many different angles of it as teammates in the locker room that could pull you in different directions. And I think that's what makes it difficult. JC, you're right, though, because we've talked about the other issues with this football team. They have not been good enough along the lines of scrimmage on the offensive line and the defensive line. Matthew Betts came back, heralded pass rusher, reigning most outstanding defensive player. He's only got one sack. And I know it's not everything in terms of affecting the passer, that sack category, but he hasn't been, I would say, as noticeable as he was a year ago. And you can't blame him either because he's coming back from a training camp with the Detroit Lions where they had him at linebacker, even though his best spot is a pass rusher, putting everything he had into that opportunity and then trying to jump back in with the Lions and pick up where he left off. It's just not that easy. And the other guys get paid too. But I think for BC to even have any shot in the postseason on the road in Regina or on the road in Winnipeg, that they have to get better up front and play more physical football. Otherwise, the season's going to be over real quick. I agree with all that, boys. I will give two quick corrections. Uh, No, in Week 7, the BC Lions did not get killed by the Stampeders. They lost by one point, but it was to lose. And secondly, (laughs) Rick Campbell... Secondly, Rick Campbell is not in the final year of his deal. He's entering the final, final year of his deal after 2024. He is under contract with the team through 2025. Um, but I, JC, I fully, come on. You should know I, this. But I fully appreciate what it is you're saying. Um, th- this team, since the middle of July, like three calendar months, they've won three games. And again, good for Nathan Rourke, good for Vernon Adams Jr., being professional. And having this positive relationship, that's great. But if the relationship is positive, but the team is losing consistently, I don't think it particularly matters that it's positive, right? There are guys who have hated each other's guts in this league, and they've won together. And at the end of the day, 
the main job of a team is to win football games. It is not to be best friends. In fact, if your main goal is to be best friends and you love losing together, um, your fans are going to run you out of town like really quick, like really quick. Uh, I grew up cheering for Winnipeg Blue Bombers teams in the late 90s and early 2000s who never won, but seemed to be best friends and like losing together. And uh, I could tell you that 12-year-old John was not a happy camper. Uh, so anyways, great that there's professionalism, but at the end of the day, you, you got to win. And this team has won three games in three months. Like that's just, that's bad. Anyway, you slice it. There's no way to pretty that up. It's just bad. The Calgary Stampeders signed former NFL quarterback PJ Walker after acquiring his rights in a secret negless trade with Toronto. Could Walker be the day one starter for Calgary in 2025? You know, it seems like there's a possibility. I highly doubt Walker takes the field at the end of the 2024 season. He brought his wife and child up to Calgary to essentially give it a look-see. And then also for the organization, front office and the coaching staff, to get an idea of how Walker was going to approach things and also Walker's feel for the CFL game from an outside perspective, I think Walker could be a great fo- fit in the Canadian Football League, but there's a progression here, and it is rare to see an American quarterback, whoever they are, Johnny Manziel and the rest, come up right away and have an impact. So I think that P.J. Walker is going about this in a very smart way because what we have seen over the years, fellas, and it's somewhat quiet, is players who come up here, be it on the practice roster or the expanded PR, near the end of the season, then come back to training camp after getting a bit of a grasp of the Canadian Football League game and doing well in their, not rookie season because they've been up here already, but that next season, so to speak. So I think that there's a chance here that Walker could be good in the Canadian Football League. There's lots left to prove, but... To have a guy who's made, I think it's over $5 million USD, might even be more, in the NFL come up here and want to continue playing football, to me it shows he means business. And the fact that he brought his family with him to check it out and doesn't want to rush on the field also tells me that he wants to go about this in the proper way. Now, there's lots to be played out in terms of where quarterbacks end up who are pending free agents in the Canadian Football League as the offseason goes along. But I think it's an easier sell to fans in Calgary and perhaps President Jay McNeil, if your head coach and general manager Dave Dickinson, that we got this guy PJ Walker, who was an XFL MVP and passing yards leader and did well during his time when he started in the NFL as a potential franchise guy then say somebody who's been around the block in the CFL a time or two, like a Vernon Adams Jr. or McLeod Bethel-Thompson. $5.5 million U.S. for P.J. Walker in the NFL. And the thing that was most interesting to me is P.J. Walker came up on the practice roster. I also thought it was interesting that this deal wasn't announced. Only in the CFL can you have a double-secret nagless trade. Um, by the way, Three Down Nation did report the terms of this deal. This, the Toronto Argonauts got two negless players and a conditional draft pick away. I'm told that the condition of the draft pick is based on how much Walker plays. And it's not even necessarily plays this year. It's in 2025. So I believe the pick could be a 2025 pick if Walker doesn't play and doesn't sign back with the Stampeders after the season. It could also be a 2026 pick if, in fact, Walker makes the Stampeders roster in 2025 and even becomes their starter. Now, the reason I think it's significant he's on PR is because when the season is done, players who are on practice roster immediately become free agents. So if you're the Calgary Stampeders and you want P.J. Walker to be your guy for 2025, you're going to have to sign him to a long-term deal before your last game in the Calgary Stampeders Last game is scheduled for week 21 
in Saskatchewan on October 26th. So as of the recording of this podcast, that gives the Stampeders 11 days to secure Walker's long-term rights. And I don't think that a guy who's 29 years old and has probably realized that the NFL at this point is going to be a long shot for him. um, I don't think he's coming up here for a cup of coffee. I don't think that he's coming up here for, um, you know, to, to, to get a check from the PR. I think he's coming up here to try to build a legacy in the second best professional football league in the world. Because at the end of the day, PJ Walker could have gone back to the UFL, decided not to, decided to come up to Canada. In fact, I'm told part of the reason that the Toronto Argonauts traded him was because they wanted to sign him. And he said, well, I'm not signing somewhere where there is a long-term franchise quarterback. I want to go somewhere where I can be the guy. And that is why the Argonauts were happy to trade him. And I think they purposely traded him out of division. Um, so if PJ Walker essentially handpicked his landing spot, um, first of all, it makes sense that he'd pick Calgary, a team that needs a long-term quarterback with Jake Mayer not looking like the long-term answer there. Um, and the good news for fans is we should get a conclusion to this in the near future. And I think Dunk is right to speculate that this could be a potential sales pitch for the current regime in Calgary saying, hey, look, we've already delivered a franchise quarterback. We're not waiting till February when we can talk about Davis Alexander possibly as a pending free agent or Cameron Dukes as a possible pending free agent talking about maybe bringing back Jake Mayer. We can solve this problem now. So put faith in us for 2025. We've already got this problem solved. So I'm interested to see where this goes. Uh, my only complaint about this whole situation would have been nice if Calgary had announced it before we recorded last week, but they didn't ask us. I think you guys are spot on with your analysis, but the one thing I'll add is it cannot be understated or overstated how big of a white whale PJ Walker is for the CFL. Two years ago, I wrote an article talking about CFL neglists and the longest tenured player on each of them. At that time, P.J. Walker was the longest tenured player on any neg list, digging back eight years on the Ottawa Red Blacks neg list. That's how long that the Red Blacks kept him around, kept his rights, hoping he would come up. That didn't work out for him. They let him go. Toronto gets him. Then Toronto trades his rights away to Calgary. But it's been essentially a decade that CFL teams, one team or another, have been trying to get P.J. Walker up to Canada to play football. There is a belief that he can be a very, very good CFL quarterback, digging back to his time at Temple. He's done it in the XFL. He's done it to a degree in the NFL. I'm really excited to see what he can do for Calgary. It's going to be intriguing. Man's finally up here. Full credit to those involved for getting Walker into this league because I think he could be highly entertaining to watch on the Canadian Football League field. Canada West was off for the conference's annual Thanksgiving weekend bye. I like how they do that, by the way. You always know when it is. But there were still plenty of exciting new sports games across the country this past weekend. Which one stood out most to you? I, hey, I'll touch on the bye week first because I think that's a great point. I mean, Canada West is different because every other conference has an odd number of teams. So they kind of need a rolling by where everybody misses a week. Canada West, they've got an even number of teams. So, yeah, why not give the student athletes a chance later on in the year to get healthy, spe- celebrate Thanksgiving, spend some time with their families, have some delicious, delicious food. So I like how that works. And usually during this week, there's a little bit of a lull. That wasn't the case. This past weekend, Laval and Montreal, we'll start with them. I'm going to talk about three different games, by the way. I'm having my cake and eating it, too, just like I did at Thanksgiving with some pie. Um, (laughs) Montreal, Laval, these two teams always finish atop the RSEQ standings. Laval won the first matchup by one point earlier this season. Montreal won this matchup by a point. And the reason that that is significant is because they are now tied in the standings with one loss apiece. But the loss is to each other. So the next tiebreaker, aside from head-to-head record and head-to-head point differential, is points allowed this season. 
So suddenly Laval's in a situation where they're number one, but if they were to give up a ton of points in their last two games, they will be under the Montreal Carabans for the race to host the Dunsmore Cup. So while that these two arch rivals are that close, I also want to touch on another RSEQ game, the Sherbrooke McGill game. This game finished 30 to 24 in overtime. The reason that's significant is because it was tied 3-3 at the midway point of the fourth quarter. So if you stuck it out through three and a half quarters of what appears to have been one of the most boring games ever played, you got your money's worth in the last seven minutes of regulation and then into overtime. Crazy only in three down football moment that you could have over 85% of the points scored in a game come after the midway point of the fourth quarter. And congrats to the Varior, by the way, for getting their first win this season over the Redbirds. Last one I'll highlight, Dunk, what excuse do you have here for your alma mater? The Griffins, <laughs> yes, they beat the York Lions 33-19, to but Guelph took, and prepare yourself for this number, because as high as you think this number is, I guarantee you that what I'd say is going to be higher. They took 22 penalties for, wait for it, 415 yards. How do you take 415 penalty yards in a game? Sometimes you got to play against a couple teams, the opponents and the Zebras. I'll just say that. Oh, come on. You're blaming it on the ref. 450. That is crazy. That is a and crazy won the number. Game. How unbelievable is that? You're leaving that fact out, Hodge. No, I said they won the game. Granted, they weren't exactly playing Western. They were playing an improved, improved York team, but York is still, uh, you know, they're still not the strongest outfit in the. Did OU you guys way. hear who Corey Mace cheers for in new sports football? No, actually. Your University clients. of Guelph Griffins. You know oh, why? University oh, why? boo. His what? brother, Javon Jacobson, plays linebacker for the Griffins. Oh. So he watches uh, every game. And Javon I have a clip Jacobson that's going to go Corey out Mace's on social brother? media that has Corey May saying, go Griffins in that deep voice. I can't do it justice. But yes, Javon Jacobson is at the University of Guelph. I had no idea that Jacobson was Corey Mace's brother. That's wild. He is indeed. And Jacobson, if it. memory serves right was a roommate with a Joe and Joe at Clearwater Academy. That's part of the reason yeah, why right. the Riders took a Joe and Joe. That's where I heard that. Okay, I did. I, I knew of that. I admittedly had totally forgotten that they were related. But I do want to say, by the way, Dunk, I also love listening to Corey May speak for that reason. And a niche three-down article, maybe we should write at some point, is like the 10 best voices in the CFL. Because Corey May would be on that list. Stanley mm-hmm. Bryant would be on that list of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He's got a deep baritone and that Carolina twang a little bit in his voice. Maybe it, maybe that's an article we should write. We'll leave it to you, the musician, to do that. <laughs> My game of the week is the number one ranked Laurier Golden Hawks going down to Windsor, which ain't an easy place to play these days, and getting a seven-point win over the sixth-ranked Windsor Lancers. The Lancers had a loss coming into this game after my Guelph Griffins put it on them. But nonetheless, full credit to the Golden Hawks for clinching first place in the OUA for the first time since 2005. And let me tell you, that 2005 team from Laurier was stacked and went on to win the Vanier Cup. I'm not saying, but I'm just saying. I think you've correctly predicted the team that should be the favorite here going forward. That would have been my choice for Game of the Week as well. An impressive victory from the Laurier Golden Hawks. It's now time for Hodge's Heritage Moment. This is, I think, my favorite CFL fun fact. So if you've never heard this fact, you're welcome for sharing it. When somebody shared it with me, it blew my mind. I hope it blows yours as well. On this day in 1962, Joe Zuger set a CFL record when he threw eight touchdown passes in a 67-21 victory over the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. The Arizona State product started the season as Hamilton's third-string quarterback. And here's the shocking part. Not only that he he throws for eight touchdowns to set a record. The shocking part is this was Joe Zuger's first career start. In his first 
CFL start, throws eight touchdown passes, and actually got pulled in the fourth quarter with Canadian backup Frank Cosentino, who's also a CFL historian, has written many books about the league. I've read a couple of them. Also threw two touchdowns. So this was not only a single game personal record for Joe Zuger, but the Tiger Cats set a team single game record with 10 touchdown passes in a game. Let's start with JC. Could you imagine going up against a quarterback in their first career start and then giving up eight tutties through the air? I can't think of anything that would be more demoralizing than this. Eight touchdowns to a rookie third stringer. And then his backup comes and throws two more. I've been involved in some bad games, some lopsided losses. This would this would break my spirit. It's like a reverse Johnny Manziel. I think that's what we should call it. <laughs> reverse Johnny Manziel. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that, man, because it's unbelievable that this situation took place. But, you know... I might be most upset getting benched after throwing eight touchdown passes. It's like, yo, let me keep going. Let Joe cook. Come on now. Like, and also, I love that this happened in 1962. Like, we had just discovered the forward pass. And I don't know, maybe, maybe the riders hadn't seen it at that point. They're like, coach, they're, they're, they're throwing the ball. And it's like, yeah, they can do that. But it's 1962. It's incredible. I will also say this, Frank Constantino, I love that he's a part of this because for those of you who don't know, Constantino is a Hall of Famer mostly for his later work as a noted CFL historian, essentially writing the history of the league. I love the times when he's actually there for the history. He's playing in the game. So this historic moment with Joe Zuger, a record is set, and there's Frank probably taking notes for his future uh, academic textbooks because he's going to be ragging the history of it one day. Let's go to the three-minute drill. The Ottawa Red Blacks have signed quarterback Tyree Adams, Canadian kicker Lewis Ward, and long snapper Peter Ajay to contract extensions, which was the most important to get on the dotted line. With all due respect to Adams and Ajay, I think it's Lewis Ward. When you don't have a kicker in the CFL, that is a terrible place to be, and Lewis Ward is as consistent as they come. To me, signing him through 2027, smart move. McLeod Bethel Thompson was fined for a third time this season after classifying a call that went against his team in Week 18. Bogus. Do you think three fines in the same year is some kind of record? I doubt it's a record overall, but it might be a record for the fines in regard to bringing the league into disrepute. MBT. We love that you speak your mind. You're one of the most colorful characters in the league. But come on, man. You got to you gotta watch yourself here. And you got to actually talk about No, no, no. Keep things. doing it. Keep doing Keep it. it. Well, hey, at least <laughs> talk about things you know what's up. Because his whole critique here was based on a misunderstanding Who of the cares? rule book. If you're going to be the smart guy up there, at JC, least stop yelling at the clouds. You sound like an old man. He is an old man. <laughs> I am. I was born an old man. This year's Grey Cup is being broadcast in the United States on CBS Sports Network. Do you think it'll draw a big audience, Doctor? Man, it's on an NFL Sunday, and you know, the CFL just can't catch a break. Do you guys know what game is on that NFL Sunday? That's going to no. actually cross over with the Grey Cup? Is it Chiefs and somebody? What is it? Chiefs, Bills. Oh, Oof. no. Ain't nobody ain't watching idea. Great Cup. Ain't ideal. I'm not saying nobody's watching Great Cup. But I'm just saying that ain't ideal because you consider the amount of people that watch the Buffalo Bills in Canada. And I know everybody out in British Columbia is like, they don't care about the Bills. We're Seattle Seahawks fans. Well, the numbers show it, okay? When the Bills play in prime time in featured games on TSN or across TSN and CTV, like they almost draw a million viewers, if not more. It's big time draw. Plus, you have Patrick Mahomes, the Kansas City Chiefs. This could be a game that is for potentially first place in the entire AFC. So do I think it'll draw a big audience in the United States? Define big. I don't think it'll be big, but I think it will be decent. And I hope that Chris Berman, a day later on ESPN in his fastest three minutes on Monday Night Football, talks about the Great Cup. He usually does it, but I hope he actually gives it some credence because, guys, ESPN in their You Got Moss segment 
missed out on talking about Keyshawn Johnson, who arguably during that week had the best you got Moss catch of that week. Where you at ESPN? I thought you're the worldwide leader in sports. Come on. Canadian defensive lineman Jake Thomas took responsibility for his late hit on Chad Kelly, stating it's the new standard in the Canadian football league. What did you think of his comments, Hodge? Well, Thomas, and he was very professional in speaking to me, as Jake always is. He took full responsibility for the hit, saying he shouldn't have touched Chad Kelly. I don't think Jake heard the whistle. I said, you know, was the crowd too loud? And he said, well, I'm not going to use that as an excuse. I just shouldn't have touched him. And uh, he did, and he got penalized for it. And he said, you know what? I, I should know better. So I give Jake credit for owning the mistake. And he's not somebody who historically has been a dirty player. The guy has played 200 CFL games, I think. I don't think he's ever been fined before, at least to my knowledge. So I don't think it'll happen again. JC, you took the liberty of creating the CFL all-rookie team, which was the hardest position to decide on. I probably went back and forth along the defensive line uh, the most because I think there's a bunch of guys with sort of similar statistical seasons, not a whole bunch of compelling candidates, but there's some other spots. We have a tremendous rookie class this year, guys. Shamar Bridges and Ontario Wilson at the receiver position. You look what Justin Rankin's doing at running back for Edmonton, but he's not even that team's most outstanding rookie. Nick Anderson out there at linebacker, over 100 tackles. I think the voters skew offense a lot of times with these awards, but personally, my vote would go with the outstanding linebacker for the Elves. Ex Riders GM Roy Shivers was inducted into the Plaza of Honor and said he still regrets how he left the franchise. What was your impression of Shivers when you spoke to him, Doug? A straight shooter, a guy that I think dislikes Eric Tillman, is clearly not happy with the way he left the franchise, which he was honest about. He wished he would have done some things differently to stay there longer. But the best nugget of all was him telling me that. When he first worked out Darian Durant, he broke CFL rules. Let's call it the Johnny Manziel, Chris Jones rule, because Durant at the time was still on the Hamilton Tiger Cats neg list. So that's how he knew, or I shouldn't say knew, that's how he thought Durant could be some sort of a legitimate quarterback in the Canadian Football League. Do you guys know who was the quarterback that went the other way in that deal, it's Reggie to get Ball, Darren Durant, it? Reggie, Ball. Reggie Ball, who never played in the CFL. So here's Roy Shivers knowing that Darian Durant is prepared and looks good to play in the CFL, sending Reggie Ball, who never came up here, one of the possible greatest heists of all time. Oh, he, also, you know, he also got Kerry Joseph that in that trade. Yes, I was going to say it was Kerry Joseph and you know some other moving pieces. So he gets two great cup winning quarterbacks, but the guy's a straight shooter. You ask him a question. You better be prepared for the answer you're going to get. The Ticats have signed receiver Justin Marshall following his release from the rival Toronto Argonauts. Could he be a productive addition for Hamilton? I think this is a great late season flyer for the Ticats. Marshall has been with the Argos for a year now, learning their system, learning the ins and outs of the CFL game with Shamar Bridges out for the rest of the year. Why wouldn't you, if you're the Ticats, bring in a guy Get a look at him, see what he's learned, and possibly look at him as a guy for, for 2025. So I like this move for the Tabbies. On that note, we thank you, as always, for listening to the Three Down Nation podcast, checking us out on YouTube. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, share with your friends, and all of the above. It helps us very much. JC and I will be back with you on Thursday for our picks for week 20 in the CFL. Here's hoping week 20, a little more entertaining than week 19 was. Until then, we thank you as always. We'll see you next time.